They're like, don't tell anyone about this public land hole. I'm like, wait a second. If you're still fishing holes, you don't know how to fly fish. You don't know what fish you're doing. You know, like, get off me. Also, it's public land. They pay yeah. for it. Yes. So get out of here with that. This is the Aptitude Outdoors podcast, where we interview conservationists, hunters, anglers, and outdoorsmen and women to bring you the greatest stories, information, and advice from the best in the world. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Aptitude Outdoors podcast. Thanks for tuning back in. Today, our special guest is Erin Kreider. She's the owner and founder of Uncharted Outdoors Women, an all-woman guiding service, and she also is the only female duck hunting guide in the Rocky Mountains, which is insane to think about. So we learn her story, how she got involved in hunting and guiding and what struggles she had to overcome. Hope you enjoy this episode. Let's dive right into it. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. I'm a huge fanatic for handmade, high quality leather and canvas products. In my opinion, they last longer, hold up better to the abuses of travel, and honestly, they just look really cool. That's why I use Badger Claw Outfitters. They've been making handcrafted products for hunting, camping, and travel since 2011, and that's right up my alley. The best part is they're made right here in the USA and are guaranteed for life. They've got everything from gun leather, belts, custom knife sheaths, wallets, duffel bags, leather and canvas pouches, everyday carry items, and more. Badger Claw Outfitters, made in the USA, built for the wild. There's been a lot of new hunters getting into hunting, especially since from what I've everything I've heard through when COVID went down and all that, a lot of people kind of took to the outdoors, which is great. But for people who have traditionally hunted for a long time, they're kind of angry about that. And I don't really have a problem with it at all. As someone who started hunting in the last you know, six years, I'm totally for it for more than one reason. Getting people outside is great. Getting more hunters out there, contributing to conservation is great. All that stuff. Is that a problem that you have as a, as a guide business and especially running all female guides? I'm sure it's even more of a hassle for you. Oh, yeah. I mean, people love to hate on us on social media for getting more people into the outdoors. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I don't really like selfish people anyways. So if they're worried that someone else that hikes seven miles in um, and is also equal as equally as deserving and paid just as much money to be there, you know, if they feel like they're more entitled than this new person, well, I hope that new person gets their elk or their bear or whatever they're doing, you know, <laughs> ahead of the veteran person who's got the ego. So we definitely encounter a lot of those kinds of people outside as well. And it's not fun. It's actually another reason we don't wear pink. A lot of women like don't want to wear pink in the outdoors because mm-hmm. we are, it's fine to be seen, but we don't be like, Oh, Hey, and I'm a girl out in the middle of nowhere, you know, like yeah. we'll stick to our orange. It's like one in four women have been uh, domestically abused. So um, and here we are putting guns in their hands for the first time, like since. Oh, good. So yeah. it's to have that other new hunter out there paying just as much as a veteran hunter. Um, it's very empowering and it supports conservation and it supports public land, which is decreasing. So like they're the veteran hunters, like favorite hunting spot may, might be owned by some billionaire next year. Yeah. So Better also believe to get more women and other unlikelies in the outdoors. That's it's funny you say that because my wife and a lot of the friends I have locally who are women, they're like, yeah, I just love going to the store and I have three options of clothing to pick from pink off purple or like gray. They're like, it's really what I love all my shoes and everything to be matching. And it's, <laughs> I mean, it's funny, but it's not funny. It's all, it's like, there's three colors for women to pick in the outdoors. Teal, yep. I guess too. Teal. <laughs> Teal's a big one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they love they love to sell you guys teal. So w- you're you're uh, interesting to me in the fact that you're an a- adult onset hunter, which I always joke that sounds like a disease, and it is in a way because <laughs> once you're in, it's like it's game over for everybody I know that I've gotten involved in hunting. It's an obsession, and it's a, it's great, and I think it's one of the best things. And I'm hyper biased. Hunting for me has changed my life in so many ways 
And I think it's just one of the best things you can get people involved in. How did you get involved with hunting as an adult? Because it, it seems like a lot of people have a lot of different stories, but it just kind of becomes this thing that we all are like, I think I need to do this. It feels like the right thing, at least for me anyway. Yeah, it kind of happened naturally. Um, I mean, I've always been pretty avid about fishing, whether it's uh, with a spin rod or fly fishing. Now it's mainly fly fishing. Mm -hmm. And seeing those ducks run around and hearing the way that they communicate with each other and seeing duck hunting videos and how they come into the spread and decoy and how people will communicate with them to do that, that kind of blew my mind. Mm -hmm. So that's where I started when I was 30. Um, was duck hunting and it was easy with a shotgun. I definitely, I, well, let me take back that it was easy. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> actually nothing about it was easy, but you don't have to have like the best aim, right? Like you're going to go out there, you're going to see some birds, hopefully, mm -hmm. and you're going to take a shot at, them. you know, it's not like the other kind of hunting that we've got right here in my backyard where you're, you have to buy like a $2,000, you know, like mag rifle and then drive up this rocky mountain and then trek in. And I'm like, I had knee surgery. I don't plan to do that again. You know, I needed something easy. Wake up early, sit in a blind mm. on the river. Like I was already pretty much there. So it's just kind of like the next step. But yeah. Finding someone to take me was pretty tough, which is why I became a, a waterfowl guide. So that is all I do is take mm -hmm. brand new, usually women, uh, a lot of unlikelies, uh, but usually women uh, come out and they're just trying to get their first experience without getting yelled at. I definitely was yelled at <laughs> the first couple of times. So it's, I just started yelling back, but yeah, hey, it got me to. in there. Then I just hunted private waterfowl um, areas in Northeast Colorado and then in the mountains and kind of all over um, got bullied, shotguns waved in my face by other hunters. I feel like it's just so true that waterfowl guys are just like the scum or not guys, waterfowl lures are like the scum of the earth. Like if you want to find the worst kind of hunter out on public lands, I guarantee it's a waterfowl dude. And, uh, like they've taken my reservation that I booked online right out from under me, you know, on Thanksgiving. So it's just... Yeah, they're that's the worst. Shitty. Uh, <laughs> that's that's messed up. Yeah, I we have some public. I mean, we have pretty good public hunting, duck hunting up here where I live, and I have never once seen a woman out there hunting ducks ever. Which I mean, I'm more than willing to take anybody out there and do that. I'm not a guide or anything, but I just love waterfowl hunting. I yeah. got my first waterfowl hunting experience last year, and you know, one of the things that like in the Midwest here, it's all like deer hunting. That's like the thing. Deer, deer, deer. It's, it's what I learned mm -hmm. on. And it wasn't that intimidating because it's just, you're on dry land, so that's easy. You can pretty much right. go anywhere and hunt a deer. You, They're pretty big, so you, like even in, here, if they're 30 yards away, you really still don't have to be that great of a shot with a gun. <laughs> so it's like, it's pretty, it's like a low entry and, you know, you can get anything at Walmart. But I, I was always put off by duck hunting for a long time. I would say six years almost because... It's just everybody says how expensive it is, how you have to have so much equipment, and it's really not true at all. I've found it's really, it's really simple. It's a, the concept of duck hunting is simple. Mm -hmm. In practice, it's not as simple because ducks are a different ball game just because of the way they they are. So, what are what are some to, to like new hunters out there who are intimidated by duck hunting as I was? What's mm -hmm. the bullshit and what's the fact? That's what I'm so, always interested in. So like any hobby, you can spend as much money on it as you want, right? Um, but really, all you need is six scared little mallard decoys here in the Rocky Mountains. That's all you need. Six little scared, like, right? Just bunch them all together. Um, Sometimes it gets so cold here, I put them on the bank. So you technically like you don't even have to totally get in the water if yeah. you're trying to figure it out unless you actually get one, which is great. Then you got to get it in the water. Yeah. Um, but I was hunting a lot of warm water sloughs that weren't very deep. I don't have a dog and I'm like five foot two on a good day on a tall day. So um, just getting some muck boots and getting mm -hmm. out there and on public land anymore. I was starting to go in the afternoon. 
Um, the ducks are patterned. They know there's a bunch of people out there in the morning, but in the evening, you know, no one's really out there. Mm-hmm. So you get out there and just seeing, just even seeing them work, even quacking at them, whether they run away or they come on in. That's like, that's pretty cool. And I started with like a cheap $10 double read call. And I just learned the feeder call and I just sat there. Um, I did drive around quite a bit to see like what the other ducks in the area were doing. So I would go over the bridges on the South Platte River and like, were they on the bank? Were they scared and like all bunched together? Or were they really spread out and in the water and like doing all of their things? Most of the time they were sitting on the bank. Mm-hmm. So you really don't even need super heavy decoys, like the cords that go to them. Um, but being a woman, I did, <laughs> I did want a very specific shotgun that fit me and that was expensive. Um, I will say if you, if you, if you want to invest a lot of money in, um, like any type of hunting that involves a shotgun, get a good shotgun that fits you. There's too many times that I have women in my blind that their shotguns are from dad, grandpa, brother, and they don't fit the same way. Like their stocks are huge and they can't mm. even pick it up or it's a 28 inch barrel when they should have 26. Um, or it's a 20 gauge when we need every bit of those pellets in a 12 gauge when it's five degrees in January. Like those birds are, they have a lot of feathers mm-hmm. and the girls, when they're first out there, they're not great at getting them right in the face, right? <laughs> they're kind of back there on the tail feathers and the wing. So you definitely need all of those pellets. Um, and I also looked it into a lot into a good choke for my shotgun. Um, I was always told that you needed to have a modified choke when I didn't want to, I didn't want to buy a blind like on public land. I didn't want to drag that thing in. I didn't want, I didn't want to have to bring all this stuff. Plus I like hate plastic. So I'm going to br- buy the least amount of things as possible. Um, so I sat quite a, quite a bit back from the water. And so I always use a full choke, uh, which you have to be more accurate, but you should anyways, like let them land if you don't have a dog in Colorado, mm-hmm. with some States you can't do that, but here you can let the birds land, get a good look at them and then take the shot. You know, it doesn't, it, they don't have to be flying. <laughs> yeah. There's well, yeah. And there's so many thoughts about how to hunt and whatever. And a lot of them are very old school and traditional and the world changes. Sorry, people like things are not the same as they were 40, 50, a hundred years ago, and they never will be. And you're just going to have to get over it. And a lot of people have a lot of opinions on how to do things. But I always tell people when people ask me how they get started hunting, I was like, the best thing you can do is buy a decent shotgun that like you said, that you fits you because Mm -hmm. it opens you up to pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. You can hunt anything with a shotgun. I have not found an animal yet that you cannot hunt with a shotgun (laughs) at all. And I mean, it's, it's a great, it's a great entry. Like I'm not big on anything. Like the camo is whatever. I just have what is whatever I bought when I first started hunting and I'm not, I'm not (laughs) upgrading. I don't care. I wear, I spend more time outside than anybody I've ever met. And I run around in camo and I'm killing just as many birds as the dude next to me with the $3,000 $3,000 and shit on. So I'm just like, whatever, dude, I don't really give a, <laughs> and, yeah. and that, that intimidates a lot of new hunters, but the amount of them going out there is, there's a lot of hunters going out there right now. Um, mm-hmm. with, so with duck calling specifically, I just did a video with my friend, Andrew, who's like a really good duck caller. Is there any, anything specifically about calling that is important versus, cause the, I even hunt with guys that are scared to blow the call because they're scared of looking stupid, which is just a human trait. <laughs> yeah. I am not that way. I will scare every duck away trying to imitate the guy <laughs> yeah. next to me. But what, is there any any tips you have for for people getting into it with, especially with calling? Because that for duck hunting, I think that's what scares the most people, whether they're yeah. nervous about looking stupid or scaring the ducks away, which is my only concern. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, who doesn't like scaring them away, right? Like that's part exactly. of it when you get started. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's what they look like. Um, uh, how I got started was there's a playlist on Spotify where the gentleman goes through the different types of calls when you use them and he blows to the back of the call. So that's super helpful. Um, and however loud you are blowing that duck call, crank the volume down is like my number one thing. 
Because if you are making a mistake, don't make it super loud, right? Um, the main thing in Colorado, because no one's really hunting the ducks in Wyoming, right? There's just not a lot of people that live there. So they come from Montana <laughs> on down here where there's like, there's definitely hunters in Montana, right? Then they go through Wyoming and they kind of forget that it's hunting season. Then they get here and really the only call you need to know is the comeback call and the feeder call. That's kind of in a quack. That's pretty much, don't make it too complicated, right? Like corporate America is out there like, you need to buy all this stuff. Please don't. Please don't buy all the things. Please like save some money for retirement or like your family, <laughs> you know, as a recovering financial advisor, you don't have to buy all the things, you know, yeah. buy the things that A, fit in your budget, your hobby budget, and B, like spread your money out a little bit. If you need yeah. a good pair of waders and a good shotgun, go cheap on the duck call. Because if you know where the X is, like where they like to land, then do you really need to know how to call real good? Nope. <laughs> A lot of a lot of people I know that are very good callers said the calling is to impress other people. All that crazy competition <laughs> calling and stuff they do. Like I yeah. I hear ducks quite a bit because like we have mallards up here that just sit on ponds all winter long, and that I I go out there and listen to them. I'm like they do not sound like that guy. They mm-hmm. sound like they're just hanging out and chilling, feeding. Yeah, you know, calling. They're just doing their quacks every once in a while. It's not it's not insane, and that's. For me, that's what was really important. It's like just get good at like the main calls. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're if you're o- the way I look at this stuff is if your only hobby is duck calling or ducks, do whatever, go whatever, go all in. I like right. to hunt everything. I'm out here yeah. during squirrel <laughs> season, rabbit season, deer season. If it's huntable, I'm an edible. I'm out there hunting it. Yeah, so I'm like that's where I'm at. I'm buying. You know, I have a couple of duck calls. I have maybe like three or four. But it's only because I didn't like the one that I started with. It was just like I blew it a billion hours, and I'm like, I don't really like this call. I got a different one. It's not like yep. I want to have every duck call on the market so I can look cool on Instagram. That's yeah. where all the cool people are. But is with decoys too. I bought. I just met some dude on Facebook and bought like forty dollars worth of decoys off of him. <laughs> yeah. him. I don't even know they float. I don't know how long they'll float, but they'll probably get me through a season. Uh, yep. Is with decoys? Do you think? that the way they look is important or is it more important that they're they're visible to a duck and in a position where a duck would likely fly into them? They got to be in the right spot. Like if the ducks are cold and maybe they're not in the water, then your decoys better not be out in the middle of the river, right? Because those ducks are going to be like, that's not real. <laughs> um, I always like to throw in some geese, which I also got off Facebook Marketplace. The guy that I bought them from was very surprised to see me show up in a truck at his house to pick up decoys. But um, yeah, I throw in two or three geese just to like make the ducks a little bit more comfortable. I've heard of people having like crows and cranes and seagulls, which is cool. Geese here in the West is kind of like the norm. So that's, makes sense. yeah, they got to be in the right spot. Um, I've also heard like down in Arkansas, they just, they just have spray paint. Uh, their decoys just black. I've never I've hunted down there. But it's like they have to be in the right spot um, compared to what they look like. When I got mine, um, I actually re, I, it was COVID times, right? So I re hand painted them. Me too. Which is a great, great uh, craft night if you've got friends that want to come over or if you're trying to get the kids something to do. Um, throw, get some paint out there, <laughs> you know, yeah. paint some decoys. It's like an active meditation. And while listening to a duck hunting podcast, like, that's a great day. Yeah. And so I did that and yeah, threw them out there and lots of girls who have shot birds over them. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I hand painted the ones, the guys, they were like so faded that they had no color on them. So I took <laughs> half of them and I just painted half as mallards and then half as mallard hens. And then they look terrible. I have no painting skill in my life. No one would ever call me a uh, physical medium artist of any way, shape or form. But I mean, they're ducks. They when you look from the top, they can like even if you take like the people fly those drones over them and you can see what they look like when they're all schooled up in a big pond or something. The backs they look white and black. Mm-hmm. When you look at a duck close, they're very beautiful. They have all these cool colors, but from above, they look like white and black. They have you can't tell the difference. So that's always my thought process too. I, I always am trying to think of like how would the duck see it flying in? At what do they fly like fifty miles an hour or something insane? They just come hauling yeah. ass in. 
Well, and eighty percent of the action happens when it's still dark, you know, mm-hmm. right at shooting light, right around that time frame. So they really can't see, you know. But I do like to hunt in the evening when it probably is a little bit more crucial. Um, but yeah, they're coming in hot, and they're either going to do it up or they're not. So, yeah. so why why is it so much more difficult for women to get into hunting and fishing? From your perspective, I obviously do not have that perspective, and I'm a very bullheaded person, so when I decided I was going to do this, I was like, I don't care if anybody's helping me. I'm just going to figure it out. (laughs) Uh, And I mean, I think you have to have that mentality regardless of of who you are, but do you Mm -hmm. think it is more difficult for women because it's such a male-dominated industry? Is that? Definitely. And I walked off Wall Street, right? Like, it the egos are bigger without the money, which is really weird. Um, and like these guys aren't curing cancer or HIV or like, you know, fixing world hunger. So I'm like, what is your ego about, man? Like the, I'll, I definitely get bullied. Like where are your pile picks? I'm like, um, these are first time hunters. It's a blind full of girls. You got to pick like that. that was, it's definitely hard because, well, in Colorado, I called a number of outfitters in north in the northeast section, and none of them would even take me because I was a girl. Happy to take my husband. They called him back. He left the same voicemail, except way worse. And um, they called him, but not – they wouldn't call me. I've been left at the truck before when I got there. Um, so that's like the – and there, there's not another female waterfowl guy that I can find in the Rocky mountains. So I really was relying on my network to take me hunting. (laughs) And when, and also when someone takes you hunting, like fill up their gas tank, um, or your gas tank, don't make them pay for anything, make it a day for them. Mm -hmm. Bring the, bring the food, bring the cold beverages, like, or hot beverages, like bring everything you can be prepared and don't be late. Um, never be late But to get to, to find another woman that, (laughs) <laughs> that would have taken me would have been a lifesaver. And that is why I started Uncharted Outdoorsman is I needed it back when I was learning and I could have fast tracked where I was and not, not had shotguns waved in my face and not be begging for people to go with me at four in the morning to be in the parking lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but also it's hard for women to get into it because there's just not a lot of clothing brands that can afford to create a size for each, each way that we come. Mm -hmm. So um, you got to be out there in something that's comfortable. If something's too tight or something feels baggy, or you just don't feel good in it, it's not going to be a good day. (laughs) So you'll see a lot of women wearing Sitka, which men hate on, but you know what? They're, they're out there making it. They're trying, they're investing in it. They put no women in their brochures, which drives me nuts. Uh, But it's good stuff. Like if you're, if you have broken every pair of waders, except waders made of Gore-Tex, then you got to invest in the Gore-Tex waders because you're a shenanigator like me. Like, I'm tearing those things up. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you got to find things that fit. It's hard for women to find things that fit. But there's fortunately becoming more and more opportunities to find companies that are invested in fitting women specifically. Um but we just come in so many sizes, like coming from a business perspective, it's going to take a lot of money. Yeah. Somebody, surely someone out there is super passionate because if I, I mean, I own a lot of women owned brands because they're women owned. I'm all about supporting women. And, um, when you get to meet those women, they have the same story. I do. Mm -hmm. No one would take them. Nothing fit. It sucked. And now they own a company. And yeah. here we are. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. And I I think there needs to be more people who are willing to fight that battle because like, yes. I mean, if we're going to be honest about it, dudes don't give a shit. They're out there doing what they're doing, you know, mm-hmm. like, and I, I go out of my way to try and help anybody who wants to get involved with hunting because it's such a pain in the ass for me to get started as an adult. And I have... No, nothing going against me. I'm just an average white dude that was like, hey, I want another people, anybody to take me hunting. And it was still a huge pain in the ass. Oh, so yeah. I can't imagine how much harder it is for you coming into this, people telling you, like, get the hell out of here, which sucks. And yep. I, I've 
tried to, I don't, I'm not like a missionary. I'm not like trying to convert people to hunting. I'm just trying, I'm a, at heart, I'm a conservationist and I'm like, I really care about wildlife. That's why Mm -hmm. I got into hunting in the first place. That's Mm -hmm. if, 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 if the North American model of wildlife conservation disappeared, I probably wouldn't really hunt anymore because I'd be like, well, it's a lot of time and effort for nothing. It, it benefits conservation. And I've always cared about the environment, animals, and and all of this stuff. And it seemed so contradictory to me to start with thinking, why would I ever want to kill something? Well, it makes no sense to me. And then I started understanding conservation more than just the word. It's mm-hmm. very like bastardized and and how we talk about it nowadays and like this true meaning of how it's in a specifically in America. And when we talk about conservation, there's so many different people. There's like the world wildlife association and stuff. They talk about conservation, but really in America, we have a very specific model. It's not all hunters and fishermen, but it's mostly hunters and fishermen and women. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got into it. And I, saw on on your was reading through your website you have you employ vegetarians which oh, to yeah. most people would seem insane but i have had so many one-on-one conversations with vegetarians and i'm like i'm not arguing with you we have the same end goal but i just yep. do it in a way that makes sense to me how do you reconcile that with friends who you have that are like that because most of them that i've talked to are like okay you're kind of right. I'm still not going to kill anything, but you're making a good point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they care about, that's why I call them unlikelies, right? Vegans yeah. too. Yes. Um, and my background's in animal science. Like I, that's what my degree's in. So mm-hmm. having that conversation with people that don't consume meat is very normal. Um, they just don't know. Just like, like we get a lot of information from Maddie because she wasn't raised hunting she wasn't even raised around hunting where I was raised in Missouri in the ag field. Like I was around yeah. it, but never invited, which is another reason I'm an adult onset hunter. Like, Oh, she can't shoot a shotgun. Can't wait to show up to Easter this year. Uh, but anyways, but the, they, if you've also noticed that a lot of people that complain about hunters are also women mm-hmm. and they were never invited to the conversation. Like they weren't, given um, the opportunity to ask questions without being bullied by grandpa, by dad. Ah, don't worry about her. It's like, no, she's like, she's got an honest question. And now when they come to us and ask honest questions, we give them very honest feedback in a very respectable manner because we, that's their choice. Right. But man, we hand a lot of vegetarians weapons. <laughs> so yeah. they do. It is a very spiritual experience for them as it is for all of us. I think it's a misconception that, um, like, here's the backcountry in Missouri. It's just the Midwest. So I saw a lot of deer get shot, legally or not legally, from a truck. Um, and I was like, oh, this is not, you know. But then you move here, and it's like, oh, my gosh, good luck getting a deer, right? <laughs> like, we're not successful that often. Um when I think that they think that we are successful in that they don't understand hunting seasons necessarily. Um, a lot of them, a lot of folks don't understand that we are actually eating these animals. Like we don't buy, my husband and I don't buy meat from the grocery store. Actually false. He bought chicken the other day and immediately composted it because he was like, this tastes awful. It's like I was spoiled. <laughs> um, but he also doesn't hunt. So, um, But having those conversations and just being very open to answering questions and not belittling them is definitely helpful. But having a vegetarian on our team has been wildly helpful because she's like, hey, this is what that person's asking. You know, and I'm like, oh, okay, because I'm thinking something else. And she teaches our archery clinics like she loves shooting boars and turkey, like the 3D decoys yeah. with her bow, which I can't, I can't shoot very well. <laughs> so, but it's, it's just been great having like so much diversity on our team because there's very few of us that can do everything. Mm-hmm. So we're all exchanging information and we, you can have an honest conversation with your teammate about animals rights and conservation and where your food is coming from. Amazing things happen. And that's, it's funny because that's, that's the argument I always make is like, we, we are arguing the same thing. 
Yes. We're arguing the same thing from different sides of the coin, but it's still mm-hmm. the same coin. Like we're not, our viewpoints aren't that different. And I think what I've, co- I've found over these hundreds of conversations that I've had with hunters, new hunters, old hunters, vegetarians, all these people is the hardest part I think the non-hunter has with the hunting part is the death. That's the only thing that really separates a vegetarian or vegan from a hunter is the extraction of that resource with your own, like, you you killed it. Mm -hmm. And that was the hardest part for me when I started was like, that's a weight on you. Like even as a person, you're you're you often view yourself as apart apart from the like world as a whole. Like we kind of think we're the special thing, whereas like we're all part of the same system at the end of the day. And even though most of us don't grow up seeing death in any capacity, that was always the weird part. But I think once you experience that one time, you'll know whether it feels right or wrong to you. And mm-hmm. that's what I've explained to a lot of my friends is like, I'm not saying that I'm that you have to go hunt. If you want to go hunt for the first time ever, I'll take you and I'll explain it to you and I'll find something where you can be successful in, like even if it's small game. And I was like, you have to go into it knowing though that once you pull that trigger, you are making a decision to kill and or potentially fatally harm an animal. And yeah. it is now your responsibility to make sure that that ends. And yeah. then, so they're like, I'm like, so just, if you're, if you're going to pull the trigger, be confident in it and pull it. If you're not, do not pull the trigger. Give it to yeah. me. I will do it. And I yeah. think they're more comfortable with that. I don't know anyone that's like, oh, I love pulling the trigger on an elk. You know, I don't know anybody that would say that. That's like the worst part. Right. Um, but that's how you feed your family. Um, and an elk here, if you're in state is $40. $40, all that meat, hundreds of pounds for $40. That's, yeah, how people are saving money too. So, yeah. Hey, what's up, everyone? James Appleton here, co founder of Absolute Aid. Welcome to the Seek to Do More program. This program will help you help yourself by developing the daily habits that will elevate your entire life. Over the next 30 days, you'll complete the doers list every single day. And the doers list includes one, do something physical. Two, follow and stick to your diet of choice. Three, read a real book. Four, further your education on purpose. Five, dedicate time to your spiritual life. And six, dedicate time to your hobbies. So if you're ready to take a structured, proven approach to build the daily habits that will allow you to get the most out of yourself, your time, and your life every single day, the Seek to Do More program is your blueprint. So make a choice, commit to yourself, sign up below, and let's get started. Another thing that I've noticed that I've also had a hard time with is I was very, very intimidated for fly fishing for a very long time. Like the first time I went fly fishing was like two weeks ago. Uh, and I, I don't know if it's just like the fly fishermen that I've met and know are like pompous dickheads or I don't know what, what it they is <laughs> I, I, because I, I, I'm, I have a hard time explaining this to a lot of people. I came up with this podcast talking to probably some of the most philosophical and like very well-educated hunters and fishermen and women out there. So I don't have a normal hunting experience and I have friends that I've brought along with me to events and things like hunters aren't that bad and fishermen. No, they're not. I've heard all this stuff. I was like, you've met the best of the best right out of the gate. So don't think this is everyone (laughs) first and foremost, but fly fishing is very cool. I'm absolutely obsessed with it now. Uh, And it's another one of those things specifically like duck hunting where it's like, oh dude, it's so expensive. You're never going to be able to afford it. And then I'm like, I finally got to the point, like transcended all the bullshit to the point where I was like, you know what? Every time I've done anything, it's been crap. It's all been a lie. It's all Mm -hmm. been as expensive as you make it. So I got a rod and I got some cheap waders and we went to Oklahoma and we went fly fishing for two days. And I was like, nobody can cast. None of these people know how to cast. (laughs) Why do I feel like I spent a month and a half practicing so I didn't look like an idiot and nobody here is casting any better (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. so what do you is i mean am i am i on track because i feel like sometimes i say stuff and people are like you're insane and i yep. don't feel that way like you know where i stand on duck hunters right like they are the scum mm-hmm. of the earth and i am one but i'm trying to change it 
Then the the fly fishermen right there above. <laughs> you know, they're just they're like, don't tell anyone about this public land hole. I'm like, wait a second. If you're still fishing holes, you don't know how to fly fish. You don't know what fish you're doing. You know, like, get off me. Also, it's public land. They pay yeah. for it. Yeah. So get out of here with that. No, like, so we just went through a whole bunch of um, different expos for hunting and fishing. Some of them were both. Some of them were one or the other. Mm-hmm. The fly fishing expos are so pretentious and um, there's not a lot of women at them. And the women are very guarded. Like when they see us, um, they're still a little like, uh oh, you know, because they've been bullied on the water. They've seen people bully other people on Instagram. It's not OK, y'all. We need to work together. Yeah. Um, our public lands are going away without license money. They mm-hmm. are being sold to very wealthy people. So stop it. Stop it. Yes. Um, we, poor, poor ladies. Um, it doesn't have to be expensive, right? You can get a kit from Orvis for like a hundred bucks, 150 bucks. You don't need waders. You got muck boots, right? Um, Depending on the time of the year, you can just go in the water. <laughs> yeah. And you also don't have to drive two hours into the mountains to go fly fishing. You know, there's, there's bat. I'm a bass addict, right? Um, you can go bass fishing right in town. <laughs> so yeah. you don't have to drive very far. The flies can be expensive, but if you make jewelry, you can also make flies. So it's not, it could be a very, it's just a different way to connect with nature, but the amount of egos and the pretentiousness at the fly fishing expos versus the hunting expos is ridiculous. And, you know, women are the fastest growing demographic in the outdoors, right? Everybody knows it. If you don't know it, you haven't turned on like an electronic device in 10 years, but we are leaving as fast as we are getting into it because of being bullied, um, and being told that it's for this uh, this elitist population. When that's not true, do you have to release a fish that you catch on a fly? No, I got a bunch of them in my freezer right now. <laughs> you know? yeah. So uh, I think, yeah, the fact that you, you have to put them back is also pretty dumb. Um, now, there's locations where you absolutely do, right? Like there's a lot of money for that and it brings a lot of tourist money in. Hey, stop it. Um, but for the most part, most of the states, you can, hey, <laughs> but for the most part, most of the states, you can keep the fish you catch, which a lot of Hispanic families, that's what they do. That's how they feed their family. Mm-hmm. So quit hating fly fisher people. Yeah. Stop that. <laughs> the first, the first fish I caught on a fly rod ever in my life was two weeks ago under a bridge in Lano, Texas, downtown. Oh. <laughs> And it was awesome. It was like a one inch bluegill. And I had the greatest time of my life. And that's the thing too, out here in the Midwest, especially where I, I mean, there's, if you go up to Michigan, you go a lot of places in Ohio, there are trout streams, there are steelhead, there's all this stuff where I live specifically, there are not. So you know what I'm fly fishing for? Whatever bites the fly rod or the flies. (laughs) And we uh, got on tirades about this in the past, but every time that someone has that pompousness, you're turning off people, which is probably some people's intention, which is whatever. But like we, we made a, a video down when we were fishing in Oklahoma about a new fly fisherman. We took my buddy who's, who hasn't fished in like 12 years fishing for the first time in 12 years, we're like, we're going to go fly fishing and then we're going to hire a guide to take us to actually catch some fish because none of us (laughs) knew what we were doing. And the looks we got casting Zebco spinner rods with power bait on them for trout from all the fly fishermen standing next to us was hilarious. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a small person. I'm like 6'1", 260. And I'm just like, this is cracking me up because they got their like $400 Orvis rods and I'm like, dude, we just limited it out in five minutes. These dudes mm-hmm. haven't caught a single fish. And it right. the premise is hilarious because yeah. 
I mean, if that's your thing, that's fine. I don't care. But like, I was dying on the inside knowing that it was crushing these people's souls. Yes. That I limited out in five minutes on Power B. (laughs) Like, I don't know. I think that stuff, I'm just a rebellious person by nature. And I think that stuff is hilarious. But like, the pretentiousness of a lot of this stuff just drives me insane. Mm -hmm. It really does. You and me both, man. (laughs) Yeah, it's the only difference between fly fishing and spin fishing is the connection with the fish. You're just connecting differently. Yeah. That's pretty much it. You're using a little bit less plastic, but dang, fly fishermen, you got to buy all this other stuff. It adds up. You know, I'm I'm ready to switch just a Jansport backpack. 10 bucks, you know, back to school sale. (laughs) I mean, it it doesn't matter at the end of the day. We, as conservationists, the egos need to go, which they never will. But we need to stick together. Like, yeah. we need the license money. Our <laughs> ranger Puppy. Our rangers need to be paid more. Um, our public lands defenders need to be paid more. They're leaving, too. You know, yeah. we need them. And you know who's spending a lot of money on uh, traditional fishing tackle? Everyone. Yeah, Th- there's that's where so... everyone gets started, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm not buying my nephew a $200 fly rod. He's going to break it in 15 minutes. I've seen Absolutely. him break 20 rods already, but I won't give <laughs> I'm up still on still breaking it. rods. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, I, yeah, that's a whole other story. I, so as like environmentally minded people, I get that vibe that we're on the kind of that same page here. I'm starting to get really jaded with the whole outdoors industry as a whole. I came from backpacking. So like I've done long distance. I've done a lot of stuff out there, just like time in the outdoors. I have a ton of time out there. That's what uh, uh, eventually led me to hunting and fishing as an adult. And I saw this insane consumerism mindset in the backpacking world that completely drove me insane. I was like, dude, this backpack I have, that I've used for years has thousands and thousands of miles on it and it's perfectly fine. And I see people out there dedicating their entire life to buying as many backpacks and tents and sleeping pads as shit that they can. And then I came over to hunting and fishing. I was like, oh, cool, some good old rednecks. They're just gonna, nope, same damn thing. And it's just (laughs) driving me insane. Like everybody's so hell bent on seeing who can like swing their wallet around or likely their credit card around and buy the most dumb, expensive shit. And then I talk to experts and they're like, yeah, I don't use any of that crap. I, they just send it to me. I just, if I could go out and use whatever, as long as I'm fishing or hunting, I really don't care. And it oh. changed my mind completely. I'm just like, I don't want anything to do with it. So I don't know yeah. if you feel that way, but it's become like, how can we ter- commodify every single aspect of, of every single sport, hunting, fishing, lure on the earth. And it's just like driving me up the wall. It's almost like capitalism got us in this climate crisis. Whoa, no. <laughs> no, you can't say but climate like, either. People get mad about that too. Oh, I know. I'm like, bring it on. Um, yeah, it, it, it's especially expensive, expensive for women because most likely they're taking their kids with them. Mm-hmm. So if you teach mom something, then they're going to teach their kids as well, usually, right? Um, Because that's usually who the the main parent is too, um, unfortunately. But when, yeah, it can be twice as expensive for women and they do feel like they have to have all these things and it's this big overtaking and like to go anywhere to buy stuff for you and even taking the kid to Target or the grocery store is a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. So once you start scrolling, right, and Amazon's like, oh, you need this, and you need this, and you need, you don't need any of that. You don't need any of that. Get a rod, get some bait, <laughs> get some yeah. flies, and get a backpack, and just like hack ha- your licenses, and then have a great day outside. Take some great pictures. That's what you remember. You don't remember those fish. You don't remember the fish. Um, you don't remember what they look like unless you get them painted, right, or take, take a good picture again, but... Um, yeah, it's all about who you're spending time with on the water. And that doesn't usually requ- – if, if your friends will require you to have thousands of dollars of gear to fish with them, um, you need new friends. Um, you will find friends at Uncharted Outdoors Women events <laughs> that aren't spending <laughs> lots of money on gear. Because we – in our 101 classes, we have money-saving tips. Women love to save money. It is an addiction. If we, if we get a, a beautiful dress and it's on sale, we're going to tell another woman about it. 
So it's all about sales and, and finding the right gear. Um, but you don't have to spend a ton of money. You don't have to have everything. That's corporate America being like, buy this, buy this. So we get richer. You don't have to. Yeah. Um, just have a good time out there and find the things that are going to meet that objective. Yeah. I mean, and you don't have to drink either on the water. You don't have to do that. Yeah. Sometimes. No, <laughs> but I, yeah, I'm right there with you. And I think it's, I don't know. It's just all, everything's been blown so out of proportion from what I've seen in every aspect of everything. It's just insane. I was talking to somebody the other day about, they're like, oh, well, you know, you got these nice fishing shirts or whatever, like AFCO or whatever, the high end fishing shirt. I was like, I have never once bought any of this stuff. This is like things that I've gotten either through the podcast or that have been like gifts from family members. Mm -hmm. I don't buy this shit. I, every yeah. hat I've ever worn on this podcast was just, you, you go to trade shows, you like, you just get this stuff. It exists. Yeah. I wake up one day. I'm like, why do I have 600 hats? I don't, yeah. I don't even have time to wear all of them in my life. Like I yeah. don't have that many heads. I only have one head that I can wear them on. So it's, it's just crazy. The amount of stuff out there. But like with one thing you talked about, I think that I'm starting to find now I'm, I'm, I'm six years into this. So I'm, I've bought a lot of gear. But now I'm starting to figure out what's actually important to me. And it's really not that much. The gun, that's kind of important. That's important. The specific rod for a specific species that you want to go after. Like I just talked to a guy and a, and a fisheries biologist about how to catch big bass. I'm tired of catching small bass. I want to catch <laughs> big ones. And they're like, you're not going to want to hear this, but you're going to need some specific equipment to like really do this correctly. And I normally would be like, that's bullshit. But these dudes like know their stuff. They're like, he's a fisheries biologist by trade. And I, there's yeah. other guys I know that have caught in like 10 pound plus fish. Oh wow! And they're like, it's going to cost you some money, but if this is an actual real goal of yours, you're going to have to do it. So I'm going down that rabbit hole, but it's like, I'm not going to stop using my $20, uh, ugly stick that I've caught hundreds of bass yeah. on because yeah. I love that damn thing. That will be my favorite fishing pole to the day I die, I guarantee. So that, yeah, I like, thank you for breaking that conception with people because it's just like all I freaking see online and it just hurts, hurts my soul. <laughs> and you wouldn't believe like how many companies want to just throw stuff at women too. It'd be like, hey, sport, you know, support us. And it's like, wait a second, ladies, especially you women of color, they should be paying you. Yeah. Us girls, those white girls, we're a dime a dozen. Um, all of our women of color, they get paid by brands to be repped. They don't pay me. <laughs> you know, I don't sponsor anybody. Um, Orvis, I will tell you, Orvis is so amazing to donate and ask nothing of us. Uh, but donate rods, like their, their rod kits for our 101 classes, they have been great. All of their packaging is very eco-friendly and they donate money back to conservation. That's the one brand I'll tell you that I really support. Um, they just they just sent me uh, twelve more rods. Like they didn't have great. to do that. Mm -hmm. You know that's great. That's a lot of money that I can put towards something else. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you don't need to buy all the stuff. <laughs> so, so how many women on average are you seeing come through your programs? I mean, you're specifically women organization, which is great. I think there needs to be those. I've, I've talked with Renee Thornton who does, who started the women hunt program with wild sheep. Awesome program. Uh, and I think it's really great to get people more comfortable. So like how many, how many women are you putting through your programs, hunting, fishing, whatever, every year approximately? So last year, just last year alone, we had just under a thousand women come through our program. Um, so they were learning how to shoot a shotgun. They were learning how to fly fish. They were learning how to forage, even though my attorney hates, hates that I use that <laughs> word. She says, I can't eat my liability waiver even says like, if Aaron used the foraging word, you know, don't believe her. <laughs> um, any other F word she's open to, but not that one. Um, even learning how to hike, um, learning how to ID specific plants, learning how to scout for big game, shed hunting, uh, regular spin fishing, you know, some women aren't brought into that. They want to know how to do it. There's a technique, right? Got to know where the fish live. Um, this year we're, we're hoping to get some big time permits and do a whole lot more where we can actually guide some big game hunts, but we're going to do a lot of mentored hunts this year because that's what our demographic wants now. 
Um, and we're hiring guides <laughs> and guide. Can we also talk about how guide is like such a weird, like there's such a weird tie to the word. Hey, I'm a guide, you know, I'm not weird. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, just under a thousand women. And if it's outdoors, most likely we ship horseback riding too. Most likely we, um, are doing it except no snowmobiling, <laughs> no ATVs and no rock climbing. Can't do any of that, but everything else we do. Awesome. So it's, we hire women based off of like what they're confident, like what their craft is and what they're confident in that. And then we're trying to close the wage gap because being a guide at a normal outfitter, the women, they might be on top, but as soon as they have a baby, they're sent to the bottom. Cause you can't just call, can't just call us up and we find a babysitter, you know, the night mm-hmm. before. So we've employed a lot of women that the fly shops have mistreated and then we pay them significantly more <laughs> than the fly shop too, almost double in some mm-hmm. cases. So, and they get to pick their clients. And obviously we have the best clients. They're pretty much all women, folks from the LGBTQ community and gentlemen. We don't have like, you know, gas and oil bros from Texas that just want to catch trophy trout that don't yeah. exist naturally in Colorado and have an unreal expectation. Um, but some outfitters, they love that. Like that's their ideal clientele. That's not yeah. us. We had a thousand women that we reconnected or created a connection with nature. And now Colorado Parks and Wildlife wildlife has their license money to keep our land public and keep the habitat upkeep. Not, not saying that they're public or that they're perfect, Mm -hmm. but the money's there and we are as the fastest growing demographic, we're giving them that second opportunity to create connection with other women. Number one, learn exactly how to do it. You don't shoot deer from a truck. (laughs) Like I thought you did when I moved here. Um, it's not legal and, uh, they get the education about conservation and why it's important and why these deer got to go and why the geese definitely have to go. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's funny because that's, I just got back from Texas, which is a whole different ball game when it comes to hunting and fishing. It's just a different world. Their whole model is different. Everything's different. Uh, and their guides are probably used to the guys you were talking about. The because they have no public land. Yeah, the oil yeah. bros who want to just <laughs> shoot anything that moves, and they'll pay ten thousand dollars to shoot whatever it is. And you know, we were at a conservation conference of of like dorks like me who talk about why I like animals and not just wanting to blow their heads off. Mm-hmm. And we were out. We went out with a guide. We were supposed to do guided hog hunts, which. It's supposed to be like the easiest thing ever to hunt in Texas because there are a million of them. Couldn't find any hogs. So the guy's like scrambling. He's like, in his mind, he's probably like, these guys just want to shoot something. So we get out of the truck and I'm like, oh, cool, a hog. And like, I'm thinking like, I'm going to take this thing home. I'm going to eat it. It'll be great. And he's like, he gives me the gun. He puts it. He's like, all right, shoot it. I'm like, what is it? (laughs) He was like, he's like, oh, it's a raccoon. I was like, I don't give a shit about shooting a raccoon. He's like, looked at me like I was insane. And then he's like, well, anybody else? And I'm like, dude, you have four people who are conservationists in this car. Nobody's going to want to shoot this raccoon. And everybody's like, yeah, I don't, if it's not hogs, they're like, they're not hurting anything. I don't really care. And he was like, didn't know what to do. It was hilarious. I was like, I was like, this guy probably thinks we're idiots. (laughs) I mean, that, (laughs) that guide mentality is so crazy. I cannot find any women in Summit County that want to sign on with us because they're like, well, I don't want to guide. And I'm like, well, if you're putting a hook in the water for money, you're you're technically guiding because I have an mm-hmm. outfitter's license. But our objective is to show women how to never hire a fly fishing guide in Colorado ever again. Can you do yeah. that? I'm like, oh, yeah. You can show them how to tie on bugs. Yeah. I'm like, but they don't want to be bullied by the yeah. pretentious fly fishing guide. They don't want to be bullied by the duck hunting losers. You know, they don't, they're, they're, the egos just tear, tear things up for sure. And there's a huge difference between a hunter to hunt to kill and a conservationist that's trying to ethically take an animal that needs to be taken out and feed their family for yep. sure. And I think we've done a really great job with at least a thousand, almost a thousand women last year, having them think this and get them to hear. Mm-hmm. I you think know, that's important. I don't important. know any other person. I don't know any nonprofits. I don't know anybody that can say that they did that in one year 
by themselves. It takes an entire team yep. for sure. And my, my wonderful husband who built me a nice website <laughs> to, yeah. to do that, you know, and we it's, need it. It's great to work on things by yourself. I know because I do a podcast and I, it's all just me doing stuff. But working with other people makes it so much better. Like I filmed a documentary last year and I had a friend who was all in on it. He helped. And it's a hundred times better than I ever could have made it by myself because he's like, your ideas are stupid sometimes. And I'm like, yes, thank you. I needed that <laughs> yeah. because I think they're all great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and it's important. And, and the mentality you say with a guide, it, it, it cracks me up because I just had this conversation with a friend the other day. It's like the same thing when you, when someone calls himself a videographer, there's like this, like they're more proud of that than they are of like a person working any job. And like, I, I constantly get this thing. I still have a full-time day job and stuff. And I do a lot of stuff that's just normal work that a normal person does. It just happens to be a video work. And someone, so like, I get this comment all the time. They're like, you need to go out on your own and start your own production company. I'm like, I don't want to have to beg people for money all the time. I have a nine to five where I can just do my job and then go hunt my ass off all the other and fish all the rest of the time. And I don't have to worry about where my next paycheck's coming from. There's like this pretentiousness of like the word videographer that is funny to me. I'm like, it's just a job, dude. Like you're just yeah. a guy who knows how to use a camera. It's not that big of a deal. Like chill yeah. out. <laughs> don't worry about it. And I feel like yeah. I know a lot of people in that same scenario with guiding. They're like, they put this word to it and it's like, oh, I'm a guide. I'm like, every guide I know, they're like, dude, I don't ever get to hunt or fish because I'm constantly taking people out and I'm exhausted. Yeah. I got to get up at like 3 a.m. every day yeah. and go to bed at like 2 in the morning when I'm done packing up all my shit. So I feel that. <laughs> it's funny. It's just funny how these certain uh, professions have this prestige around them. Like you said, you used to work on Wall Street. That's pretty prestigious. But it also sucks. You quit. It sucks. <laughs> the discrimination there cannot be changed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it is forever the way that it is but you get a cool title i guess you know <laughs> yeah i mean i could say that i did it uh i was really really good at it and the industry is missing out and but this one's not and this one's significantly more fulfilling even though i didn't get to shoot at as many birds here's there's my ego i get to shoot at as many birds as i wanted to because i was taking other women mm -hmm. um and getting my fulfillment that way uh, my freezer is not as full as it should be, but you know, they got a lot of them got their first bird, which a lot of them were teal. And that was my first bird. Those little, those suckers are so fast compared to like the big boys. Um, but yeah, there, it's, it just feels good helping, helping women with what I needed when I got started for sure. Yeah. And there is no ego. I don't hire any women with ego. They apply. And I'm like, I don't know where your ego is coming from. You're the most repulsive human being I've ever met. And I definitely don't want you to represent our brand. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there just doesn't need to be an ego. It turns us off. You know, it turns anybody off, really. So, hey. <laughs> he is really cute. I'll, I'll have to show him to you. But yeah, um, no, I, I, here, I he's looking at me now. <laughs> <laughs> it is a cute dog not a waterfowl dog that's a sinker <laughs> that's a whole that's a whole different topic in and of itself people with waterfowl dogs are very passionate people and they have a lot of uh more um strictness with themselves than i would because that dog would not be well trained it would just be running around causing havoc because i don't have the patience for that but yeah i'm, no, I think I'm the I, weak one for yeah. sure I think what you're doing is really awesome. And I think that it is important for more women to get into hunting and fishing. Anything that's like dominated by one or, one or the other of anything is just, it, it ends up being boring. Like it's just the same shit over and over yeah. and over again. <laughs> like if I know, if I, there's, I don't know any women around here that are interested in hunting. I know one lady that does hunt. And she wants to hunt by herself and she doesn't want us hunting with her, which is totally fine and understandable as well. But I think it's, 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 I don't know, it's easier to get dudes into hunting because they're like, guns are cool. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not really that worried about it. But for women, it is difficult. And I'm trying. Like, guns are scary. Maybe we've had one pointed at us before. Maybe we've yeah. been abused and there's a gun involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's different. And men, I'm sorry, they can't do it like we can. 
That's all there is to it. <laughs> yeah, we're not as uh, men are not as uh, don't have as much finesse. I feel like <laughs> they're just kind of like. Go for it, dude. Hell yeah, brother. That's that's the vibe. I mean, that's the vibe I put out. So, well, Aaron, thank you so much. Uh, if people want to get involved without Uncharted Outdoors Women, where can they find more about you guys? I know you're pretty active on social media and stuff like that. And if they want to come work for you and they live out where you live, or I don't know how, how big you guys spread out across the U.S., but I mean, wherever they can get hired, let them know because it sounds like a great opportunity for a lot of people. I'm the founder of Uncharted Outdoorsman. We are the only female outfitter in North America and we operate in Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, and Oregon. And we're hiring. We create space for women and other unlikelies in the outdoors. And you can find us on unchartedoutdoorsman.com. We are on social media and Instagram. And we provide hundreds of opportunities for women and other unlikelies to learn and be educated in the outdoors, as well as do guided fishing and hunting. 